One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. All right, thank you. Who out here is jet lagged like I am? I just came in from New York today. Okay, a few. <laughs> this is also uh, my first time sort of introducing this concept and giving this talk. So I wanted to put something together that was a little bit uh, practical to kind of leave you with for the evening, and we'll get to that at the end. But I've built my career around making it easier for people to share and create images. Pretty much everything I've done professionally has been in that vein. Um, I was employee number eight at Tumblr and eventually ran our engineering and to some degree our marketing group. Don't put engineers in charge of marketing. Just <laughs> That didn't go so well. Um, and at Tumblr, something really fundamental to everything we did was this idea of lowering the barriers to creation as far as possible. So you know, Tumblr was built in, in contrast to other methods of blogging, other methods of sharing on the internet that always she had this huge white box in front of you that was this sort of terrifying thing that, how, how, well, how am I going to fill that? I'm going to have to learn HTML. I'm going to have to learn JavaScript. I'm going to have to you know, figure out how to format images the right way. And Tumblr was about making it so that you're never, share, you're never scared to share an image that inspires you or that you're excited about. And the really fundamental uh, tool for that was this little button. This is the, the reblog button for anyone who's not used Tumblr before. And the reblog button was all about making it possible to put something out into the world without having to actually create it. So if you saw an image on someone else's blog that inspired you, you simply tap that button, and now all of your followers see that. So if I have 100 followers, but one of my followers has 10,000 followers, they hit this button, now 10,100 people have seen it instead of just the original 100. And so this was really... Uh, you know, something that was about enabling images to spread very far and very fast. And I've taken a lot of those sort of principles from Tumblr into my new company. Uh, it's a social media app called Beam. Another thing I don't recommend doing is starting a social media app from scratch. Um, and Beam is about even taking away that single button press and making it so that you can share images and you can, in fact, share your experience of the world with zero button presses. So our guiding principle is that we can create more empathy in the world by sharing, trans share sharing experience and making it possible to share experience without any need for editing, any need for understanding what, it's, what, what the tools uh, that you would traditionally consider are necessary to share images. Uh, the way that Beam works, and I'll just give a little demo now, because if I share a video, it proves that I'm uh, not just on vacation. Um, <clears throat> so the way that Beam works is whenever the app is open, if I just hold my phone to my chest, I'm sharing what I'm actually seeing. So right now, say hi. hi. So just by doing that, pressing no button, simply holding the phone up like that, I recorded a little six-second video and shared with everyone who follows me what it's like to be here at Do Lectures. I'm just going to add a little context to so they know. Hey, I'm on stage at Do Lectures in Wales. And then it goes back in my pocket. So I just shared, if you count the frames, that's probably you know, a few thousand images, but <laughs> at least two videos with, uh, without having to edit anything, without having to press any buttons, without having to think about it as actually creating video. Um, and I see this as really a progression from the kinds of things we were doing at Tumblr that really are just about making it possible to share more and more and more images more and more quickly. And a real belief in the, the potential of that to create more empathy in the world, to create more understanding. Because someone can see what it was like to be me on stage right now, they might have a better understanding of who I am and where I'm coming from. And when you see someone who's completely across the world, has a very different perspective, and they're sharing in this sort of raw way that removing the barriers to creation allows, it's pretty incredible. So I'm someone who's in incredibly excited and optimistic about images and about the, the, the sort of exponential growth of image sharing in the world, and I've enabled a lot of it. Uh, that said, I have a lot of skepticism as well. So I'll get to the skepticism in a minute. But just to give you a sense of the, the scale of images in our world today. So photography was invented around 1838. 
19th century involves uh, a process that's lots of unstable chemicals, lots of changing technology. Uh, you essentially have to be a hobbyist or a specialist to use photography. The 20th century, as we all know, is, is all about the mass media and it's all about the commercialization of photography. Uh, photography is arguably, photography and image creation are arguably some of the most successful technologies uh, in existence. And in the 20th century is that, that sort of mass media was fueled by photography and image creation. It still pales in comparison to what's happened in the last 10 years. So this chart is, is very silly and has no scale and uh, is just a big curve because it's, it's almost impossible to quantify this. But I think it, it's pure, or it's almost impossible to quantify it year by year. There's just so, so many data sources sort of all over the place. Um, but there's no question that in the last 10 years, the number of images created and shared and consumed in the world has gone exponential. And the reason that it's gone exponential in the last 10 years is the smartphone. So to give you some real numbers behind that, in 2015, there were two trillion images that were shared on social networks. So likely something like three or four times that were actually stored on people's phones and they just decided it wasn't worth sharing. But those two trillion images that were shared, that were shared in 2015 that's more than the number of images taken on all film ever. And that number is only accelerating because in 2015, about 35% of the world had a smartphone. If you believe the ITU data, which I think is reasonable given the last few years of growth, by 2020, 80% of the world will be in possession of a smartphone. So 80% of the world will be able to create images in this way. So we're going to go from those two trillion images, that entire history of film photography, being created in a year to being created in a quarter to being created in a week uh, in just a matter of the next five or six years. And we're consuming more and more images as well. I mean, it's not just the smartphones that are the source of this. Uh, it is the mass media. It is Facebook Live. It is all of these new sources uh, that are putting more and more and more images out into the world. And we as, as a species seem to have a sort of insatiable appetite for them. This is a fun little gift montage that's probably going to distract you from my next bit. Um, images are not just a benign thing, though. This exponential increase isn't just, okay, great, we're just seeing more of the world. Uh, images are also, to some degree, control. They control our decisions. They control what we buy, they control what we eat, they control what we see, they control who we love. There are very few decisions in your life that I think if you really consider, you can't trace back to an image. I imagine almost everyone in here who is at the lectures looked at the website, looked at images of the farm, looked at images of past talks, looked at videos before they decided to purchase. And that's true of pretty much everything we do in life at this point. We are in this absolute flood. <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> we are in this absolute flood of images. And even beyond controlling our decisions, images are how we convey our emotions now. Um, GIFs are moving into this realm where you can send someone a text that's simply a 12-frame moving image, and it can convey whole sentences of emotion. So we are really in this place where images are touching every single aspect of our life. And that's really great in some ways, but I think there's some, some aspects of that where we can think more critically. Um, and when I think about what that, what that attitude or what that perspective on the world is for us who are just in this absolute flood of images, what I wanted to look at was a, a contrast, to sort of look at historically what was the situation with images? What was it like to see and look and deal with images even 500 years ago, which from an evolutionary perspective is you know, two seconds ago? So I did a little research uh, on, on what it would be like to be here in Wales about five or 600 years ago and what kind of images you would see. So these are, this is uh, a wall painting from a church about 60 miles south of here. Uh, these are, they're actually Venetian coins, but they were found uh, here in Wales around the period I'm talking about. And if we're talking 1600s, when uh, England took control of Wales, that's the uh, English king's sigil for Wales. And so these symbols 
if you're a Welshman or Welshwoman 500 years ago, are probably the only images you would see your entire life. And really, to, be, to even see this one in the corner, the coins, and the, the uh, you know, sign of probably the king or queen who is on them, you would have had to have been relatively wealthy. You would have to have traveled relatively far. Most people are going to be operating on barter. So you know, you're living in a world where there are an extraordinarily small number of images that you spend an extraordinary amount of time with. You really think about them, and especially when it comes to liturgical images. Like, you know, those are the images that, when you go to church once or twice a week, you're being taught based on. They are pointed at. They are looked at. You've seen them thousands of times, and you really, really have a much more intimate relationship with them. Uh, this compares with the world today, where, you know, there are so many images you see every day. It's almost impossible to find good data on them. Uh, the, the best sort of real study that has trustable numbers that I've found would say that everyone in this room has already seen 500 advertisements today. Not images on Instagram, not the sort of flood that's coming from your smartphone that I'm talking about, but simply advertisements. And that's an incredible, incredible contrast to someone who has seen three or four images in their entire life. And necessarily a very, very, very different relationship to those images. And when I think about this sort of flood that we're images, of images that we are living in, uh, I was also thinking a lot about the purpose of this conference. And a lot of the language that David and everyone here uses around the conference is sort of taking time out, uh, you know, setting aside the calendar for a few days, and really getting to sit with ideas and, and let them soak in. And I think we, we tend to think of the sort of palate cleansing that we need as being purely in terms of time. It's about getting control of our schedule. It might be about meditating at the end of the day and not thinking about the clock. Um, but it tends to be very time focused. And to me, there's a whole different kind of palate cleansing that we as a culture who are living in this sort of exponential flood of images really, really need to face. Uh, and that's the visual. We need to find ways to change our relationship with images so that we're thinking about them more critically so that rather than simply let them guide every decision in our life, we're actually interacting with them, asking important questions about them, um, and sort of stopping this flood. And so I've come up with a little exercise, and I, I very much call it an experiment. It's something that I've been doing personally for a couple of months now. Uh, I've introduced to some friends, and I, I really am talking about it publicly for the first time. But I consider it an experiment because I really would love you to try it. I would love your feedback. And it's something that you know, I hope to share more widely after this. But it really is an, just an attempt uh, to give us a more critical relationship to images, to sort of disrupt this flood of images a little bit uh, and let us think differently. And let us think a little bit more like that medieval person who had really the time and the space to question and think about and really dig into the visual material uh, that sort of saturates our world. And so this is a, a daily habit, and it's a pretty simple one. It has two parts. The first part is to just capture an image. And this is, you know, I, I kind of think of it as uh, reaching into this flood and just pulling out a fish and setting it aside. This is just stopping and pulling any image out in front of you. And at first, I thought it would really matter what the images were, and some of them would work and some of them wouldn't. Totally not true. Uh, I think some of my favorite times doing this exercise are an, a subway ad I captured uh, or you know, a random silly puppy image. And you know, the way that I do it, the way I assure that I'm, I'm really pulling a sort of random image for this exercise is I have an alarm set on my phone, 2 o'clock every day. 2 o'clock happens. And I'm probably looking at my phone already, so the image I need is just right there in front of me. Um, but if not, I look for the nearest image to me, I capture it, and then I just put my phone back in my pocket. And then at the end of the day, uh, much like you might have a mindfulness exercise of you know, meditating or sitting quietly or something like this, I do this visual mindfulness exercise. So you know, part two, I pull out this image that I captured earlier in the day, and I turn airplane mode on my phone on, and I don't let myself do anything but look at that image. And 
often the first two or three minutes because we are so adjusted and we are so visually literate, we can move really fast. The first two or three minutes, I'm like, well, I, I got it. I know it's, you know it's a cute puppy. It's got a weird hat on it. Great. And it's only after a couple of minutes where I'm really forcing myself to look closely at this. Do I start to ask the really important questions? And the questions that I think are really the point of this exercise, which are, who took this image? Why? What were they trying to say to me? What was left out of the image? Where did it come from? What, what emotions does this bring up in me? Do I like those emotions? Uh, you know, do I want to see more images like this? And it really is an uncomfortable thing for I think a, a modern person, a person who lives in this flood of images, to just have to sit with one. Uh, you really, really struggle for the first few days to ask these questions to really kind of dig in. Um, but after doing this for a few days, I've found that it fundamentally changes the way that I look at the world. It fundamentally changes the way that I look at advertisement. It fundamentally changes the way that I look at all of the flood of images that is on my phone. Uh, because I start to ask these questions and I start to think about, well, what if I were looking at this for five minutes? What would I want to know? What would I start thinking about? Um, and so this is a really, really simple exercise, a really simple experiment. Uh, I call it visual mindfulness, and I'm going to ask all of you to at least do part one, and hopefully tonight do part two. So this is like the most against this conference thing to do, but I'm going to ask you to all pull out your phones. <laughs> Uh, and open your favorite sea of images app, probably Instagram or Tumblr or Facebook. This is like, yeah, so, so not about the, uh, the do lectures ethos, but it'll be worth it. And whatever that first image comes up, take a screenshot. And if you've never taken a screenshot before, it's really simple. You just hold the power button and the home button at the same time. You'll hear a little snap. Everybody done that? So you've done part one. And now tonight, when you go back to your tents, I want you to sit and stare at that image for five minutes and see what happens. And I would love to hear your feedback. Because like I said, uh, you know, as someone who has been really responsible for creating this flood of images in a lot of ways, I'm really interested in, in ways uh, that we can become more critical, and I hope this is one. And I would love to hear from you if this has helped you, if you hated it, if you loved it. Uh, so please, come up to me. Thank you very much.